this PowerPoint is about 50, uh, about 50 slides, 40 something slides. Nothing too terrible, nothing too mind uh, melting or anything like that. So I think uh, this one should be pretty painless for, for you guys. All right, so here we go. Supervisory control and data acquisition, uh, also known as SCADA. And as the title here implies, we have supervisory control and data acquisition. So really it's, it's kind of two separate things that are uh, unified to create this type of a system. Our objectives here are going to be described SCADA applications, uh, components and installation uh, considerations for SCADA, and then a long drawn out section on standards, codes, and licenses that are associated with SCADA systems. Um, and that's largely because there's uh, lots of different uh, applications and lots of different communication methods. Uh, and as such, each of them uh, tend to have their own standards and codes and things of that nature. Okay, SCADA is a distinct process application uh, typically used on remote geographical applications and oil and gas fields are a prime example here in Alberta, but they're also used uh, in other types of scenarios where there's a, a large geographic area, power distribution, water, wastewater, uh, things of that nature uh, all fall into that same kind of category. They consist of four uh, basic functions. Um, first, and foremost, data acquisition, which is the remote measurement and monitoring of our process variables and collecting, uh, collecting that data so that we can use it. There's network data communication um, between all the different uh, remote sites and the host. And as such, it may involve multiple communication protocols. Uh, it has a data presentation component, which is the HMI section of it, where the uh, the operators can interact with the uh, field devices. And there is the supervisory control element, which involves the remote communication and control. So uh, supervisory control and data acquisition are the major uh, components, but all wrapped up within uh, a SCADA system. We have all these, um, these four components here. So <clears throat> I don't think any of this is surprising uh, to any of us here. Okay, so a big picture of a SCADA system here. Basically, we have a master terminal unit that receives all the data uh, from all the remote field devices or remote terminal units, as we see, see illustrated here. And these remote terminal units uh, each will have a station. John? Each have a unique station address um, so that the, the master can request information from each of the RTUs in, in some type of a format based on the configuration. And then these RTUs are basically standalone sites, wellheads, pump stations, whatever, that have their own IO, their, their own controllers, uh, and radios that will transmit uh, that information back to the master terminal unit. Component characteristics of SCADA. Uh, so starting from the field, uh, we have all our field measurement devices and the buses that are associated with the field measurement devices. Uh, whether it's point-to-point -point or multi-drop uh, buses. Uh, we have controllers and I.O., just like we have in a normal uh, PLC-type system. Uh, we have communication networks and HMI. So this isn't really any kind of uh, any different than a uh, uh, process system in a plant, um, except that these are, you know, remote locations and they're much, much uh, smaller generally. Uh, in their individual size. Okay, field field devices and buses here, uh, basically the same as any other, other industrial application, uh, with the exception that some of the devices are more technological. Uh, and when we're talking about which ones are more technological, we're generally referring to uh, flow computers, uh, which can, um, by nature of their technology, measure control, um, process information and report at the same time. And we talked a little bit about flow computers in third year and, and the benefits that you get from a flow computer. Uh, the fact that it has a microprocessor of its own and often has the abilities to uh, manage its own uh, loop 
independently of the of the control system. Needless to say, it is usually integrated into the overall package anyway. Um, but that's kind of a unique distinction with uh, the field devices anyway in a SCADA system. Otherwise, looking at uh, the field devices in a, in a SCADA system in this graphic here, we'll see that it's really um, basically the same as a, as a regular control system. We have our field devices, our uh, field I.O. coming into a, a controller, going into our uh, flow computer or our RTU or our PLC system or the rack. And then that information through a communication card of some type gets sent off out to the SCADA host that utilizes that information. <clears throat> Control and I.O. Again, most SCADA systems are just scaled down versions of larger PLC and DCS systems. Uh, they have the same general functionality. Um, the differentiation really is, is just less I.O. for the most part. Communication networks are a little bit different when we're talking about SCADA due to, the, due to the remote nature of SCADA sites. And as a result, communication has unique challenges. And we talk a lot about uh, the communication challenges in the ILM. Uh, things like uh, intermittent communication that's a result of uh, different types of communication methods, wireless communication, for example, uh, notoriously uh, sketchy in some locations. Uh, and that's a concern when you're trying to control a process when uh, information may or may not be getting uh, where it needs to be in a reasonable amount of time. So we'll talk about that a little bit as, as we uh, move forward in the ILM here. Real-time uh, data time stamping requirements. So uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, what happens if we have intermittent communication and what happens when the data that we're, we're looking at uh, arrives sometime after an event has occurred. Um, and one of the issues with SCADA, or, or used to be an issue with SCADA, is the fact that if we had intermittent uh, data communication, we might not be reacting to a situation in, in a reasonable amount of time, or we might not know when that data uh, was transmitted or received. Uh, it has evolved uh, over time uh, to include time stamping. Uh, on our data, and we'll talk about that a little bit um, more in depth in, in a future slide here. Historical data transmission, uh, alarm and event record transmission requirements. This is uh, very similar to a regular PLC or DCS. Um, we're still collecting historical data for trends and uh, recording performance and things of that nature. Uh, we're still collecting alarm and event uh, data uh, for analysis as we would in any other type of control control system here. But what is really important <clears throat> is how we address that intermittent communication. Uh, and we'll look at several techniques to deal with it, uh, such as redundancy and something called buffering data. And in our computer age here, I think you probably all have a general idea of what buffering, uh, buffering is. Uh, in a process sense, it's kind of like having a search tank uh, for information. Okay, HMI is another section of the SCADA system here, some form of software that exists that allows us to gather and view the data from a variety of sources. This is where the HMI comes in. It enables us uh, to collect uh, information from different languages and protocols and communicate with and in between uh, these different types of equipment and is how the operators run the plant. It is also the main way that we interact with the process, and that is why we call it the human machine interface. Okay, most HMI software, and we just covered this on previous uh, ILM. Uh, so just a quick little review. I don't believe this is in this particular ILM, um, but most of these HMIs contain the basic building blocks that we see below here. Uh, InTouch is a manufacturer or a particular software uh, brand called InTouch, and, in it, and it's not really any different than uh, any other type of HMI software. It's going to have a database. It's going to have some type of a GUI that we can use to visualize it. It's going to have a process historian, alarm manager, uh, part of the data acquisition system. It's going to have access names and communication server topics, which are uh, basically addresses 
and communication uh, interfaces where we go to uh, retrieve data and to share data between uh, devices and, and protocols. All of these things need to be configured in a SCADA system in order for it to operate properly. <clears throat> okay, uh, talking about that importance of real-time data again in the SCADA system, it's important, right? We have to have relevant information so that we can make adjustments to the process as required. Um, when these things uh, are located in distant uh, places geographically, um, we want to timestamp the data uh, locally at that location and then send it. Uh, that way when it is sent, if there is some lapse uh, between the time that it is sent and the time that it is received, it will be able to be picked up on the receiving end because it is timestamped and we'll be able to make uh, adjustments uh, according to that uh, time di differentiation if there is in fact some time differentiation. Some protocols are better at it than others. And in particular, uh, we mentioned DMP3 here, uh, which uh, by nature of its design uh, can send timestamp and process data at the same time. Uh, as we go through the ILM, you'll see that DMP3 is specifically related to uh, power distribution um, information and power dis distribution applications. And one of the reasons that it is uh, capable of doing this is it tends to transmit data uh, over wire uh, because it's a power distribution network. It has the infrastructure in place, the wiring, the power wiring that it's distributing, and they can, uh, just like heart, superimpose uh, control signals over top of the uh, power signals. And it's kind of like voice over IP or power over internet or, or something like that that we use for uh, home use but in an industrial type application. Buffering, uh, alternative to time stamping is the main way that data is captured to avoid time delays in poor communication situations. And basically what buffering is, is uh, sending the data from the measuring end to a, a buffer or a storage area where it's held. And when the communication link is established or restored, that information can then be forwarded to the uh, to the host, and ideally uh, it would be timestamped, but that does not always occur. Okay, related processes uh, that utilize SCADA, and we mentioned earlier, oil and gas is a big one here in Alberta, but water and wastewater processing, for example, uh, has lots of reservoirs and pump houses, even within uh, a smaller geographic area like. The city of Red Deer, for example, we have about a half a dozen uh, different pump houses distributed throughout the city to maintain uh, pressure for water supplies, uh, several reservoirs, uh, some which you can see, uh, like the big green, uh, like the big green tower that we have here in town, but there's also underground uh, reservoirs distributed throughout uh, most water and wastewater uh, facilities. Pipelines, another great application for SCADA. Um, SCADA takes representative measurements as material flows um, and is uh, used for leak detection uh, in pipelines. So often they'll have uh, flow, uh, flow measurements throughout uh, the distribution network of a pipeline and these flow measurements are used uh, to indicate leak detection, which is pretty critical uh, in a pipeline and environmental. Uh, in the environmental aspect of pipelines. Oil and gas production is usually the typical example that we use uh, for SCADA, and that involves, of course, lots of remote well heights, uh, well sites. Uh, uh, a SCADA host site, for example, could have tens or hundreds of different wells uh, that provide it that all would be individual RTUs. And last but not least, power transmission. Uh, which is a prime user of DNP3, which we'll talk about specifically later. Um, power distribution, huge geographical uh, grids, right, from corner to corner and often in between provinces. Okay, system components for a SCADA system. Uh, nothing really new that we're going to see here as we look at the system components. What I want you to pay attention to 
as we go through here is what what components are in what section uh, of the SCADA system. So we break the system up into three basic sections, uh, the front end for host, uh, the communication network, and then remote sites. So uh, host environment here, this is where your HMI type stuff is, or end user type stuff. Uh, it could be an office in Calgary, it could be a, a host site uh, in the field, in the center of a field somewhere, or somewhere convenient in the field. Communication environment is somewhere in between the two, tending usually to be more towards the field side, but we'll look at that later. And then, of course, the remote environment, which is the uh, the remote sites themselves. Okay, the host, <clears throat> by definition, is the primary location for data transfer to and from uh, remote sites. From here, we scan and pull the devices. Uh, we have the operator interface and historical recording and reporting. The network consists of hardware and software that forms a local area network. And we've seen this configuration uh, in other applications earlier uh, throughout, the, throughout the course here, but we see we have a bus with our servers on it, our workstations on it, uh, printers are on it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, firewall or web server uh, server so that we can get out to the uh, internet and we have what they call a te telemetry server or communication server which is the link between our remote sites and and the host uh, area itself <clears throat> okay um, still talking about the host here uh, hardware components that you're going to find in the host include the hmi workstations the recording and historian server the acquisition server uh, the remote access server and the printer, and these were all uh, hardware that we've seen on the previous slide here. Okay, again, looking at HMIs, in case you were still foggy on the purpose of an HMI, um, but it is obviously to provide an operator interface to allow for interaction with the process, and in process control, it looks like this. But these other examples here are all different types of HMIs. Okay, data historian and reporting server, uh, not much different than uh, we have in a regular PLC or DCS. It does the same thing. It collects all the information, warehouses it so that it can be used uh, going either way towards the host or back towards the field devices, final control elements, et cetera. Uh, the historian retains a record of the system performance over a period of time. And this is used to analyze things like production regulatory uh, requirements, failure analysis, data trending, uh, and also for accounting and billing. And one of the, one of the things that we get uh, with RTUs, uh, oil and gas specifically here, and the benefits with flow computers, uh, flow computers can collect all this information, tabulate it into uh, a report of its own, and send that data straight to the host so that the host can extract it and generate these types of reports that we see on the screen. Uh, the main reason I mention this is because back in the old days, the operators would have to cruise a circuit uh, every day and go and take uh, readings from their uh, devices, the flow transmitters, et cetera, uh, and record it and tabulate it over the duration of a month. And then at the end of the month, they'd have to correlate all this information and then, and then send it in an envelope uh, to head office so that head office could uh, look at it and make their analysis. But now, uh, thanks to flow computers and advancements in technologies, the system itself can send all this data uh, real time uh, to those people that require it. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Michael. Is that uh, water usage or power usage for residential use this method? SCADA? Yeah. Collect our yeah, bills? All of, yeah, all of all of the different applications, whether it's water, wastewater, oil and gas, power, uh, it doesn't matter. It's all it's all collecting the, the same same type of data and making it available uh, to whoever to whoever needs it, whether it's an operator or uh, an accountant. Okay, data acquisition server here again, another part of the host. 
uh, the data acquisition server or the DAQ or DA or OPC server, whatever you want to call it. It is the uh, repository for all the information that's collected from the process. Uh, and it's stored, of course, in this server so that the control system uh, can use it in its algorithms and so that the people that need the information for reporting can extract it from, from the system. Um, built within, within the, this acquisition system uh, is the ability to integrate the different protocols so that different devices can transmit their data in the way that is required of that particular uh, that, that particular system. So common uh, protocols used with SCADA. Um, Modbus is the one that we most often think about uh, as instrument control technicians uh, in Alberta. If we're talking mostly about oil and gas, Modbus is kind of the big one. Uh, DNP, again, more tightly related to power distribution. And then there's a couple other ones, uh, ROC and BSAP. Uh, you can look these up if you're interested. We don't really mention them in the ILM. But again, part of the data acquisition server, um, which is again part of the host uh, collection of components in the SCADA system. All of this is still talking about uh, the host. <clears throat> okay, the remote access server, again, uh, all part of the host here. Uh, the server connects to the rest of the world. It allows operators to surf the web on night shift. Uh, it can be read only, so that can changes so that changes from the outside can't be made, or you can configure it so that you can enable changes from the outside, so that operators don't have to make callouts to fix issues. And this is becoming more and more common, uh, where we can receive alarms and notifications right to our cell phones, and operators can do uh, rebooting and process adjustments right from their their telephones, uh, and to do that, that's through the remote uh, remote or web access server. If you're utilizing the remote server, of course, security is uh, very important, and we'll use uh, user access layers, firewalls, and things of that nature in order to uh, filter out who gets what privileges and access to uh, what capabilities of the of the system itself. Printer. Part of the host, uh, no surprise, uh, there it prints things. Okay, the communications network. Uh, page 16 here. We're going to spend a bit of time talking about different uh, types of communication that are utilized for a SCADA system. Uh, it's not just wireless, although it is very common to be wireless, but it depends basically on what infrastructure uh, is available to the system uh, to transmit that data. So we'll look at uh, these five uh, different scenarios here, lease lines, short haul wireless, long haul wireless, satellite and wide area networks. Um, all of them involve uh, different types of medium, wired or wireless, and some of them have combinations of uh, different mediums. Okay, so first off, we're going to talk about leased lines. Uh, and leased lines, as you can see here, are physical uh, wires, as you can see, connecting uh, our remote sites with our, with our host. Significant features of leased lines is that they are dedicated lines that are run from a site for a company. These lines are separate from telephone and other lines, such as power lines. Uh, they cost a lot but you don't have to share them. So they're your own transmission medium. Uh, this isn't like uh, trans transmitting over the uh, existing grid. These are dedicated lines that your company has paid for and they're yours. <clears throat> Second uh, communication format is called short haul wireless. And as the name implies, this is uh, defined as a short distance less than 10 kilometers. <clears throat> it is wireless, of course, and as uh, a wireless communication method, they are governed by uh, the Government of Canada, who treats the radio band as a, as a natural resource. 
and they operate in a particular section of this band, which is called the industrial, scientific, and medical band of the radio frequency. Um, as a result, they're, they're shared with many other uh, networks that use this section of the band and thereby are subject to interference may or may not be a concern. The advantage to them is they do not have any fees attached to them, so they are very cost effective. Range for short hole wireless type networks can be extended by using a mesh topology. And we didn't really talk about a mesh topology, um, but basically uh, a mesh, mesh topology is becoming more and more, uh, more and more common. If you have, uh, I'll give you a simple example. Um, my house, uh, we, we have Shaw, that's our internet service provider here. And we have one of these Bluetooth, or not Bluetooth, uh, Blue Curve is their, their brand of modem. Uh, it's a wireless modem, and then they sell you these little pods, uh, which are basically retrans retransmission devices that you plug in in different parts of your house. And the way that they work is the signal from your main router gets uh, sent and received to one of these pods, and then this pod can, can take that, that information and then transmit it to a next pod that's a little bit further away, thereby kind of expanding uh, your network, and it's a form of mesh uh, networking. Rosemount, with their wireless transmitters, uh, use this quite a bit. So if a tank farm, for example, uh, can be quite far away from a control room, but if you can get a good signal to the first transmitter uh, in the tank farm, it will retransmit to the next transmitter, and so on and so forth, uh, in, in expanding the overall network. So that's kind of one way that you can extend a short haul uh, network into a, a, a wider range. Next up here we have long haul wireless, so similar of course um, to short haul, but these have licensing requirements and fees attached to them. Uh, and with the licensing and fees you get more power, uh, and because you have more power you can transmit farther, so they identify a range of about 40 kilometers for long haul wireless. Uh, benefit here is less interference, uh, the downside is, is that it passes less data uh, due to a bandwidth restriction, uh, typically less than 25 kilohertz here. So you can see you send it out at 1.2 gigahertz and then you're, you're going 10 gigahertz basically in your, in your wireless and then back to 1.2 gigahertz. So you do lose a little bit of your bandwidth uh, as you're transmitting in the, in the wireless range here, but uh, still better than short, short haul. Satellite, when there is no other option, there is satellite. It is expensive and it is slow. It is used when you are so far away from the infrastructure that there really is no other option or you need a backup for long haul wireless. And that's all we're really gonna say about satellite. Okay, last but not least, uh, WAN is a good option if it's available. They are cost effective and fairly, fairly reliable and they can handle lots of, lots of data. Uh, a wide area network can be wired or wireless, and a common wide area network is your, your home internet or any type of internet is part of a, a wide area network, and that's why we kind of laugh when we say that it's, it's reliable, and it is for the most part. Um, but again, when we're talking about process control, we, we want to have as reliable a system as possible. Okay, most WANs uh, will use the internet for transport. So security is a problem and, and to use that, uh, we, we have identified that we use encryption and other measures uh, to uh, meet security requirements for our network. So here we have a nice little chart comparison of the different networks that we've just discussed, uh, showing uh, lease line, short haul, long haul satellite and WAN. Uh, showing them in relationship between cost, data speed, reliability, and security. And you'll see here that wireless, as usual, uh, has the lowest amount, of, uh, lowest amount of security, and wired has the highest amount of security, as well as having the highest amount of reliability. So I don't, uh, I don't expect you to memorize this necessarily, but I think it's fairly logical in the way that uh, this table is laid out. Go ahead, Michael. 
The cell phone network LTE belongs to which category? Uh, LTE, I would believe, would be called uh, would fall under WAN. But I'm not going to guarantee that. But I'm going to say it's under WAN. It's a wireless network, and it's over a wide range. So I would I would say WAN. It wouldn't be a satellite. It could be satellite. I mean, a WAN can a WAN can also be satellite too, right? Like if we looked at if we look back here, right? These things are they're still wireless. And they're, they're technically satellites. A satellite's just another really type of an antenna, uh, just that it shoots, you know, up into the up into the sky. So uh, I can't talk to LTE. That's that's more of a telecom thing. But I would say it's a wide area network. I mean, it it covers the entire country or countries. So that's what that was, that's my answer. If you need something better than that, I guess you'd have to look it up. Okay, uh, remote sites here. So we talked about the host. Uh, these are and things that are related to the host. Now we're going to look at some of the stuff on uh, on a host site here. Uh, just as it sound, remote sites are remotely located. They require certain equipment to measure and communicate data, such as field devices, controllers, I/O, and communication software. Uh, those of you who have worked on uh, oil and gas remote sites, power remote sites, water wastewater remote sites. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. I've probably seen cabinets that look like this. Uh, they'll contain uh, some type of I.O. and processing hardware. Uh, SCADA pack is a very common brand. Uh, Rock is a very common brand. Um, we have here uh, a radio uh, to transmit uh, the information. So we'll bring our information from our field devices into our uh, terminating strips here and then from our terminating strips it'll get into our IO and then our IO uh, will go to the processor and the communications card which would be in here and then that communication stuff would be connected to some type of a radio system and then this radio would be connected to an antenna that would send things uh, out into the universe. Okay, installation considerations for these remote sites because they are uh, out there in, in the boondocks. Uh, the main consideration is how is it going to communicate? Uh, that's really the biggest concern with the SCADA system um, is how are we going to get the information from this uh, remote location to, to uh, our host or our users that require this information. Uh, other, uh, other considerations include uh, network bandwidth, uh, what is available in terms of uh, communication bandwidth, uh, total cost of ownership, and we'll talk about that, and that, inclo that includes everything uh, related to the infrastructure, uh, acquisition, construction, maintenance, servicing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what regulations apply? Uh, different communication methods have different regulations, as, as we have talked about already. Um, where is our host location? Uh, and what power is available. So these are all things that uh, come into play when we're talking about SCADA and we're talking about things that are, you know, most often off the grid, um, so to speak. So we'll look at, we'll look at some of the concerns uh, related to these points in the next few slides here. Okay, communication reliability. Uh, depending on the type of process, reliability can be a minor concern or a major concern. Um, if we're just, you know, at a wellhead and we're we're pumping pumping oil up to a to a battery, uh, and we're we're filling tanks, um, having communication that's giving an update every minute is probably not that important. But it is going to be pretty important, you know, if that tank is getting close to high level, um, that we get that information before, you know, it overflows or something like that. So uh, you don't have to scan every 30 seconds or five seconds or even five minutes for that matter. Uh, so the communication, as long as it's there, we're not too worried about it. Other, other processes, compressor stations, for example, uh, where we've got engines and things running, uh, things that can overheat and seize up and explode, we want to have a more reliable communication system. So depending on our, on our needs, um, 
that'll dictate how elaborate of a communication system that we're going to need. And if it's very important, you're probably going to want to have a redundant system. And we've discussed redundancy uh, and its applications in, in other lectures. <clears throat> Network bandwidth is related to the amount of information that you can that you can send. Uh, we've all had experiences with, with bandwidth and, and throttling of bandwidth. Uh, it's a common marketing move now for internet service providers like uh, TELUS and Shaw, for example, to say, well, I'm going to sell you uh, one gigabit of uh, internet per month for $30. And it's unlimited, unlimited uh, high speed internet. And then in the small print, it says, oh, once you've used over uh, 500 gigabits, we're going to throttle your bandwidth down to 500. Uh, megabytes per second instead of a gigabyte. So it's a little bit of a tricky thing here. Um, so you have to know what your requirements are for, for bandwidth. And, and fortunately, it's, uh, technology has come such a long way now that uh, even basic Wi-Fi uh, has a pretty, uh, pretty wide bandwidth. Um, but the long story short, uh, in terms of bandwidth is if we only have a few devices, we don't need a whole bunch of bandwidth, right? If we're not downloading videos, we don't need, need gigabyte uh, internet. We can get we can get by with something much smaller. Uh, so, for an example, in an industrial application here, a pipeline uh, that's thousands of kilometers long that might have hundreds of flow transmitters, uh, it would require a lot of bandwidth. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, a pump site that has a, a flow transmitter, a pressure transmitter, a level transmitter and the temperature transmitter, well, it's not going to need very much bandwidth. So here we have a little table that tells you a general uh, general range of what you would require in terms of bandwidth based on the size of your site and the amount of IO uh, that you're going to use here. And, and you'll see here less than 50 devices, you need like a kilobyte, uh, 250 or less, 10 kilobytes. And then if you've got over a thousand, excuse me, you need uh, a megabyte. Oh, excuse me, worth of bandwidth. Okay, cost of ownership. I uh, believe it's point two uh, of our considerations uh, for installation here. Total cost of ownership uh, is made up of all the the following things here. So it's right from from grassroots when you think about, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna set up a gas field. Uh, right from that moment, right up until uh, the day you shut her down, uh, that's really everything that's involved in total cost of ownership. So the engineering and design costs, uh, these are incurred in the initial phases, uh, phases of design. And we have an installation and commissioning costs. So this is uh, probably where we fall in the most. These are typically one, one time costs. Then we have service provider fees, uh, maintenance costs, and these are ongoing. Right, and you pay your you pay your licensing fees or your uh, your your lease uh, on your transmission lines or whatever it is. Uh, maintenance costs, getting uh, ready to go out there and uh, do PMs and adjust the antennas and change the batteries and all that kind of stuff. So all of these components are uh, are covered under the the total cost of ownership, right from right from initial design to uh, right to the end when we're we're done with it. <clears throat> All right, federal and provincial regulations. Uh, lots of different regulations pertaining to not only the uh, the way that these sites are communicating to each other, but also regulations related to the specific industries uh, that they serve. So the regulatory, uh, regulatory bodies are responsible for ensuring that SCADA systems comply with regulatory uh, regulations. Uh, there's regulations that pertain to the data collection, communication system availability, hazardous locations, post reporting, and incident reporting timelines. So depending on what uh, processes we're dealing with, will we'll vary the, the regulatory agencies that are involved, whether they're uh, environmental agencies or the agencies that are uh, concerned with resources, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, host location, uh, one of the concerns uh, with uh, SCADA systems here, again, we're talking about, uh, sorry, 
we're talking about with Jesus. Got to go ahead. Installation considerations here. So getting close to the end of the list. Host location. Where do we put the host? Well, major dictator of where we put the host is where is the infrastructure that we need, right? Primary concern is communication. So if I can put my host location close to uh, pre-run power wires, pre-run uh, telephone wires, that would be perfect. That would be ideal. Uh, if we don't have that option, we have to uh, we have to consider is there uh, are there trucking companies in the area that can bring propane to my site to run my generators, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. So we have to consider uh, infrastructure in, in terms of where do we where do we locate our host? Power, of course, uh, one of the big things here. We need to have power to uh, control our, our our system, provide power for our system, power up our radios, power up our I/O, power the controllers all that kind of stuff. Uh, power is available from many sources. Uh, of course, uh, if we're connected to the power grid, that would be ideal. Um, but if not, uh, there are still many options. And we'll look at a few different options here for providing power. Uh, some of them I never noticed before, um, but uh, all pretty cool. Okay, most commonly, uh, when we think of SCADA systems here, we think of photovoltaics or solar power panels. Um, they were great. Uh, almost every SCADA system in, in Alberta that, uh, that operates has, has solar on it, um, and it works great as long as, uh, as long as we have sun. Most often, uh, you'll have some type of a backup for solar power, uh, depending on uh, you know, how, how reliable and how dependable you need the system to be. Wind turbines are another alternative way of getting power. Of course, you have to have wind and they have moving uh, parts. So, of course, there'll be maintenance issues associated with wind turbines. And I don't know uh, how popular they are uh, out, out here, but it's definitely a, definitely an option. Uh, thermoelectric, thermoelectric generators or TEGs, um, basically converting some type of fuel, whether it's uh, the stuff we're pulling out of the ground in the process or whether we have a giant propane bullet uh, on site that needs to be filled but basically they're uh, they're generating heat and then transforming that heat into uh, electricity another one uh, that got added in there since the last ilm uh, is a fuel cell generator uh, i didn't realize they added this into the ilm until uh, this morning here uh, so i had a quick a uh, quick read through it. I'm by no means an expert on this, but fuel cell generator uh, generally uh, is a, basically a hydrogen fuel cell, a very clean uh, state-of-the-art form of a battery, um, another alternative to uh, providing energy to a remote site that is not connected up uh, to the power grid uh, in the area. Okay, finally, last but not least here, standards, codes, and licenses. Um, codes and reg regulations, of course, must meet legislation. Licenses, if required, uh, must be paid for. SCADA operators, in general, set their own standards, um, but the codes, licenses, and regulations must be adhered to. So codes, licenses, and regulations are usually mandated by some type of an agency associated with the government. Uh, we'll look at uh, these uh, independently of, of standards. And again, standards are, are generally site-specific, company-specific, um, et cetera. So the operators can set their own standards, but if there are codes, licenses, or regulations, of course, uh, they have to be ab abided by uh, and, and the agencies uh, that look after them will obviously ensure that and we'll talk about a few of them here in the next couple of slides. Okay, some of the standard organizations uh, that are out there uh, and again these standards are basically just there so that we can ensure interoperability uh, between different components. Um, some of the standard organizations uh, that are involved here, the International Standards Organization, the IEC, the IEEE, CSA, 
these are just different standards organizations that are uh, incorporated in, in most SCADA systems. And we've addressed uh, several of these organizations uh, as we worked our, through, our way through other ILMs uh, in this communications module section. Regulatory bodies, however, are a little bit more serious. <clears throat> they are the government agencies that define, monitor the compliance of and enforce mandatory rules and codes. Uh, ones that are of particular interest to SCADA, uh, the National Energy Board. Uh, if you remember from third year, the National Energy Board uh, is responsible for uh, regulating any resources that cross uh, jurisdictional areas such as provincial boundaries or international boundaries uh, if that happens in any resource whether it's oil gas power uh, communications whatever it is uh, that's the NEB uh, but particularly of interest to us here in Alberta is our good old friend the Alberta Energy Regulator and Directive 17 which we talked about uh, a lot in third year uh, rears its ugly head yet yeah, once again uh, in, for, in fourth year when we're talking about SCADA, uh, particularly oil and gas. Director 17 is the document that outlines the regulations that tell us how we are to measure, when we are to measure, what we are to measure, and how we are to report it to the government. Okay, licensing agencies. Uh, this is kind of something new that we haven't really addressed before, and this is largely related to uh, communications mediums and using that wireless uh, communication and uh, and areas of that industrial, uh, scientific, and medical or, or wireless spectrum. So licensing uh, also includes things like vehicles, mineral rights radio operations or the wireless spectrum in Canada, the big agency is called, here we go, Innovation Science and Economical Development. They oversee all these other organizations that you may have heard of, the CRTC, not so much. This is the Canadian Radio and Television Commission. Measurement Canada, we've talked about uh, extensively over the past two or three years of your education. Uh, spectrum management and telecommunications, which is new and most closely related to uh, the wireless uh, communication component of SCADA, uh, the National Research Council and the National Sciences and Engineering Research Council, OOPS of Canada. Um, these are all licensing agencies that have an integral uh, involvement in the SCADA system. Global standards and licenses. This is really kind of related to um, the IEC. As you'll see here, the IEC uh, has a lot of standards uh, that are accepted internationally. Uh, the ones relevant to SCADA uh, include some standards that you will be familiar with, such as the IEC 61131 standard, which deals with programming languages, uh, standards for DCS, uh, I, I, e, 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 1815, uh, Architecture for Power Systems. Again, there's a standard associated with the IEC. Uh, 618, 815 here, this is uh, Power Systems. Uh, distribution Line Carrier Systems, IEC 61334. So again, international standards. Uh, again, touching on these things again, we've seen IEC 61131 before. This is a standard for PLCs that talks about programming languages, yada, yada, yada. DMP3 or IEEE 1815 here is that distributed network protocol uh, used to ensure interoperability between different manufacturers of equipment. And this particular specific one was designed for power equipment field. So, power distribution uh, throughout the province and or provinces, the power grid, if you will. Uh, this one here, again, closely related to the previous one, uh, 618.50 power systems. Again, uh, level up from DNP3. Uh, in a nutshell, it has better security. And last but not least here, 611.34 for distribution line carriers. 
This is a standard that allows for reliable, low-speed communication over power lines. Here's a little bit of a confusion for you, sometimes called PLC or power line communication. Uh, I don't know, they should change it to like COPL or you know, communication over power line or something like that. I don't like it when they steal uh, abbreviations that we use in other areas, but it's basically uh, similar to HART where they transmit uh, measurement data over power data at the same time. Uh, you'll see here that it uses a very similar technique called uh, SSFK, which is spread frequency shift keying. Uh, this is something that you might want to note because uh, I remember back in the day uh, there was, uh, we talk about frequency shift keying, uh, there's the spread frequency shift keying, there's also amplitude shift keying. Uh, and again, this is a different type of protocol that's used to transmit uh, measurement data sim uh, simultaneously over uh, some type of a power supply. Uh, and this is, would be highlighted as a potential IP type of question, uh, if I remember quite correctly from way back in the day. Okay, moving on, uh, getting close to the end here, federal standards, codes, and licenses, two that apply specifically to SCADA, are the Canadian Smart Grid Standards Roadmap, and again, um, used mostly for power grids, uh, and this defines the communications and protocols that are used in that application. Uh, another one specific to an application here, the onshore pipeline regulations, uh, this includes uh, the National Energy Board's regulations for the management, design, materials, construction, operation, maintenance, and auditing of pipelines. So lots of different regulations wrapped up here in, in SCADA, um, largely due to the fact that it, it, it's a large geographical area that often uh, bridges over into different jurisdictions. Okay, provincial standards, codes and licenses, nothing really surprising here. Uh, we've mentioned one of the two of these before, the first one, Directive 17, uh, measurement requirements for oil and gas. I'm not going to get into that again. Uh, new one mentioned here, Directive 46, uh, provides guidelines for auditing as well as the hardware and software requirements that are specific to SCADA. Um, I would strongly think that since we're talking about SCADA and this directive is specific to SCADA, you might want to remember that number. Excuse me. And that was the end. <laughs>